this uh, yeah. picture over here that, uh, that, uh, that actually you made. Yeah. <laughs> I made it was on the cover of the uh, Everest Bulletin that we co-authored, so it's nice to see. And I just wanted to talk to us about atomic control and plasma and so we'll things. Looking forward to it. Okay, thanks very much, Yao. Uh, so since we all just came from lunch and uh, our blood has probably all rushed from our brains to our stomachs, uh, we'll start off with something easy. Uh, so I didn't set this up with the clicker, all right? But we'll just do this with a show of hands. There's no correct or incorrect answer, but I wanted to get a feel for uh, what all of your backgrounds were. So uh, among these different areas, uh, think about which one most closely describes you. Uh, so how many people have backgrounds that are uh, sort of mostly in chemistry and chemical engineering? Okay, how about electrical engineering? Okay, how about material science and engineering? Okay, uh, physics or applied physics? Okay, uh, and then some of the area of mechanical engineering or, or something along those lines. All right, so actually quite a few people in uh, sort of the physics type areas. Uh, that's actually where my education is as well, so hopefully that'll be a good, uh, a good match. <clears throat> so I wanna, what I wanna talk about today uh, is this idea of uh, photonic control, controlling the propagation of photons in solar cells and closely related to this is this idea of exploiting plasmonics uh, in photovoltaics. So as Yao mentioned, uh, I've put up here uh, the cover image for this issue of the MRS Bulletin uh, that Yao and I uh, put together last year. Uh, and Yao yeah, did a fantastic job of generating a very nice looking graphic uh, for this. But I show this uh, because it actually uh, illustrates several of the ideas that we want to try to understand uh, over the next couple hours or so. All right, so you have light coming in, all right, uh, this is the solar cell at the end here. It's broad spectrum light, sunlight, right? So you have many different wavelengths, all right? Uh, you need to get the light into uh, this, the body of the solar cell, so you have an anti-reflection coating. Uh, and in the absorbing region, say the semiconductor, uh, it's actually quite thin uh, here, all right? So uh, it can very well be the case that light that in, that in this type of structure, uh, light that would be absorbed in a much thicker structure, right, actually is not absorbed. Okay, so the absorption efficiency is not that, not very good. And so what you do to try to improve that here is you introduce these uh, small, they can be metal or dielectric elements on the bottom that will scatter the light that makes it to the backside without being absorbed, so that uh, ideally it starts propagating laterally, it's shown down here. Uh, if that happens, then even in a very thin layer of material, where ordinarily you have low absorption efficiency in, say, a single pass of the photon, now the photons are moving in the plane of the material so they can have a much longer propagation length and you can have much more efficient absorption. Okay, so uh, what we want to do is to talk in, in some detail about the various elements that go into this, how they work, and so forth, and how uh, you can uh, try to use them. <coughs> okay, so the talk will be in two parts. Uh, in the first part, uh, I'll talk just uh, briefly about some of the factors that limit uh, solar cell efficiency. We actually heard in uh, Matt Beard's talk this morning about uh, some of this, so we should be able to go through that pretty quickly. Uh, then I'll talk about how uh, you can use this idea of controlling photon propagation uh, mostly to increase absorption, okay, optical absorption, and therefore photocurrent generation. Uh, and then we'll go into some of the background that underlies these ideas of plasmonics, uh, and then closely related to this uh, optical scattering that you can try to take advantage of in photovoltaics. So that'll be the first part. Okay, then we'll have a break. And then in the second part, what I'll do is uh, I'll try to build upon these basics and we'll see how these ideas and others come into play when you look at specific types of devices that you try to engineer this way. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, how you might do this for uh, amorphous silicon okay, and other similar thin film materials. And then I'll talk in more detail about some of the ideas that go into try to exploiting these and other effects in uh, compound semiconductor heterostructure solar cells, uh, the idea being to get a uh, very high efficiency. And then at the end, I'll talk just a little bit about how you can use some of these ideas of controlling photon propagation, not so much to increase optical absorption and current generation, but actually to increase the voltage. And that's something in which there's been, uh, I would say, renewed interest over the last uh, year or two. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, since ultimately what we want to do is try to improve the efficiency right, of, of solar cells, then uh, a good starting point 
is to look at the various factors that actually limit the efficiency of a solar cell. Okay? So you have uh, sunlight, broad spectrum elimination, right, coming in and incident on your solar state, so I'll say a semiconductor P injunction. Uh, photons that have energies that are larger than the band gap of the semiconductor can be absorbed. Okay, photons that have lower energy are not absorbed. Right? And you have various other processes that are going on here uh, that I'll talk about in a minute. What I've shown over here is a plot from a uh, paper by Charles Henry on solar cell efficiency. Right? And I, I know it's probably hard to see, but on the vertical axis, okay, we have uh, photon flux, number of photons per square centimeter per second. Right? And then on the horizontal axis, we have energy. Right? And what this outer curve here uh, represents is uh, it's, it's the solar spectrum, the AM1.5 spectrum, okay? And it's the photon flux that you have consisting of photons with some energy on the horizontal axis or higher energy, okay? So uh, if you're at a, at a high energy, you have very few photons that are at that energy or higher, so, so this is low. As you get to a low energy, you have most of your photons have that energy or higher, so, so this comes up and, uh, and reaches a maximum over here, all right? Now, if you have a semiconductor with a given band gap, right? Ideally, what happens is that all the photons with energy less than that, or with energy greater than that band gap, are absorbed uh, and hopefully turn into current. Uh, the photons with energy less than the band gap uh, are not absorbed. Okay. So, uh, for a given band gap, you have a certain flux of photons available for absorption. All right. So then you get to this point on the vertical axis, right? This is the number of photons, the photon flux you have available for absorption, right? <clears throat> now, uh, when you have photons that are absorbed, if the energy of the photon is greater than the band gap, okay, then in most circumstances, that extra energy, uh, the difference between the photon energy and the band gap is lost as heat. Okay, now there uh, is a lot of effort that's going into methods to try to capture some of this energy. So for example, the multiple exciton generations that we heard, uh, generation ideas we heard about this morning, hot carriers, solar cells, and so forth, try to capture some of this. But in a conventional solar cell, uh, this basically gets lost as heat. So the maximum energy, just because of this, that you're able to get from each absorbed photon is just the band gap energy. All right? But actually, you do not even do that well. All right? And the reason, or uh, one way of looking at it, is that when the solar cell is operating, right, it goes into forward bias. Right? And actually, the energy that you're able to get out of each absorbed photon is the electron, the electron charge times uh, the forward operating bias voltage. Right? And that forward um, operating bias voltage is limited because as you go into forward bias, you start emitting photons. Right? It acts as an LED in addition to a uh, solar cell. Right? And so the action, so when you're at your maximum power operating point, then for a given band gap in the available photon flux, the amount of energy that you get per absorbed photon is given by this inner curve, all right? Uh, and it's less than the band gap energy, okay? And then the power that you get at is the photon flux times the energy per photon, equivalently uh, current density times uh, voltage, all right? Uh, and so for different band gaps, you're at different points on this inner curve, all right? And what you want to try to do to maximize the efficiency is to draw the biggest box that you can where one corner of the box is here at the target and the other corner is on this curve, right? And so uh, that means that you're driven towards certain values of the band gap, generally in the range of 1.1 to 1.4 electron volts, because if you have a very large band gap, you're hardly absorbing any photons. Uh, if you have a very small band gap, you're hardly getting energy, any energy out of each photon, right? So, so the optimum is somewhere in the middle, right? And that'll get you to uh, a theoretical limit for the efficiency that's in the range of uh, 31 percent or so, and then somewhat higher under concentration. Right. <clears throat> now, in uh, using this idea of uh, sort of photonic control, photon management, uh, and so forth, uh, one of the main things that you're trying to do is it's not to capture uh, typically the photons that are not, not absorbed at all. It's to do the best job of absorbing the photons that have the potential to be absorbed within some limited volume from which you can collect the carriers. All right. So, so given that, it's also useful to try to understand something about um, what determines how you calculate, for example, optical absorption uh, in a semiconductor. That's what's shown here. Okay, so if you look at a book on solid state physics, semiconductor physics, and so forth, then uh, you can find expressions for the optical transition rate. Actually, this comes from Fermi's Golden Rule, right, which you heard about this morning. 
okay? And a scaling line expression that looks like this, right? Uh, the main point uh, that I want to make in showing this is, is not to explain every term in detail, but to note that there are basically two types of terms that show up here. You have these terms over here that are basically determined by the electronic structure of the material uh, that you're working with. Okay, so that's something that you can control by uh, selecting different materials, using heterostructures, nanostructures, and so forth. And then you have another term over here that's basically the square of the electric field amplitude. Okay, so it depends on the field distribution within the semiconductor. All right? And that is the part that you can control through these uh, photon uh, control approaches. So you can use, for example, metal and or dielectric nanostructures that you integrate with uh, the photovoltaic device and try to use those to control the way uh, photons propagate, the way electromagnetic field energy is distributed so that you have the maximum absorption within uh, the effective volume of the device. Okay? So you want to try to maximize absorption and in these approaches you're trying to maximize you know, mostly this or optimize this. Right? But it's not enough to optimize just the absorption. You have to have that absorption occurring in uh, the right region of the device. Okay, so uh, in a standard PN junction uh, solar cell, right, what happens is that you have photons coming in, right, they gradually get absorbed over a uh, distance that is characterized by the absorption coefficient. Okay, so uh, the intensity of light and the rate of absorption uh, decreases exponentially, right, and it is uh, over a characteristic distance that is 1 over the absorption coefficient. Right? Now, <clears throat> what you want is for as much of the light as possible to be absorbed uh, within a minority carrier diffusion length of the PN junction. Okay? Uh, if you're able to do that, then roughly speaking, what will happen is that uh, the electron pole pairs that are generated, uh, the minority carriers can make it to the other side of the junction and be collected as, uh, as current. Right? If the light is absorbed outside this region, then there will be a much higher probability that the carriers will recombine before they can be collected as current. And, and you don't get uh, electrical power out of that, at least not directly. Okay. So uh, in some circumstances, for example, in crystalline silicon solar cells, uh, you have very long diffusion lengths. right? And so even though silicon is not a very good absorber, especially at the longer wavelengths, uh, you can still get all the absorption or the large majority of the absorption to occur within a minority carrier diffusion line. But there are a lot of circumstances where this is not true. Right? So for example, in certain uh, thin film solar cells, right, where particularly where the material is very defective, then the diffusion length or some other relevant carrier transport length can be significantly smaller than the absorption uh, length. All right? And so that imposes effectively a limit on the uh, useful volume and thickness of the device. All right? And not all the photons that could be absorbed will be absorbed because it's too thick. Right? Another circumstance in which this can occur is if you look at <coughs> certain concepts for very high efficiency solar cells, things like quantum all solar cells, intermediate band solar cells, and so forth, where you're introducing material into the solar cell that allows you to absorb longer wavelength photons. Right? But for various reasons, uh, having to do with carrier transport, material properties, and so forth, very often this layer here cannot be that thick. Right? And so the absorption efficiency for uh, photons that, would, that are absorbed only in this region is not that high because it's not thick enough to, uh, to absorb. Right? And so in these and other circumstances, what one would like to do is to increase the absorption efficiency within some limited volume of the device. Okay? And, and that's really a lot of the goal of, of these uh, photonic control uh, ideas. Okay, so. Uh, this idea of trying to increase absorption in uh, fixed volume has actually been around for a long time. Uh, and depending on the type of structure that you're looking at, there are a variety of ways in which it can be done. Right? So an idea that's been around for a long time, and that's done actually very routinely on crystalline silicon uh, solar cells, is that you texture the surface on uh, kind of a several micron scale. What happens then is that the light that comes in, once it gets into the semiconductor, it's going off in many different directions. All right, so you're increasing the effective path length of the photons and thereby increasing the absorption that you have within a given volume. Right? Uh, there's a lot of work uh, that's going on having to do with solar cells in nanowire and nanorod type geometries. Right? That allows you to reduce reflectivity, okay, uh, if you have the appropriate dimensions here. Uh, and in some cases, it allows you to uh, decouple 
uh, the directions of carrier transport and photon propagation. So that can allow you to have uh, better efficiency with, say, lower quality material. <coughs> then there are the ideas that I've illustrated down here, okay, that have to do with using uh, absorption or scattering effects associated with, say, metal particles or metal and dielectric nanostructures, all right, to improve absorption efficiency in, uh, in most cases, a thin film uh, semiconductor device, either by increasing the local electromagnetic field amplitude or by scattering the light as it goes into the semiconductor in some favorable way, right? Uh, and then this is kind of another uh, way of implementing the scattering ideas where you put the scattering elements on the back side so that only the photons that are not absorbed uh, on a first pass make it down here, you try to scatter those efficiently, you can integrate an anti-reflection coating and so forth. All right, so, uh, so most of what we want to uh, address here has to do with these kinds of approaches, right? And then what is the underlying physics? How do you incorporate these ideas into devices and, uh, and so forth, all right? But before we do that, uh, what I also want to do is to talk a little bit about uh, what actually has been known for a long time about uh, the degree to which you can improve the absorption efficiency in, uh, it's most well understood in this circumstance over here, right? Where you're talking about a, uh, essentially a bulk semiconductor, right? Meaning the thickness is much larger than uh, the wavelength, okay? And this leads to what's called the 4n squared limit. Basically the result uh, that was derived 30 years ago, okay, is that if you have uh, a situation like this, then you can improve the absorption efficiency compared to kind of the, uh, the single pass absorption efficiency by a factor of four, up to 4n four squared, right? which is a big factor for silicon that's about 50. Right? So, so you can actually do, uh, do much better than the single pass absorption. Right? The way this there, there will be a lot of equations on this at the end, but uh, you know, so you can, if you're interested, look at them later. But I'll just try to describe what the basic idea is of each one of them and how you actually arrive at this. Okay, so the basic idea is that you have a certain intensity of light that's incident on uh, the semiconductor, okay? And if you have a roughened surface like this, then the photons come in, they go off in many different directions, <coughs> and because the semiconductor has a high refractive index, then the light can bounce around a lot uh, before it either uh, escapes or is absorbed. And if you look at the, pro the intensity of light that escapes, what you can show is that because the light will only escape if it's incident on this top surface at an angle that's less than the uh, critical angle for total internal reflection, right, most of the time the light will continue to bounce around. Okay? And so you build up a large intensity uh, inside the semiconductor. In fact, the intensity of light that you have uh, escaping okay, is the internal intensity divided by 2n squared, where again, n is the refractive index. And then that n squared in the denominator comes about because you have this uh, factor of the sine squared of the critical angle, and the sine of the critical angle by Small's law, Snell's law is one over n. All right. In addition, you have you have the possibility of internal absorption, right? And if you work that out, the intensity of the light that's absorbed is given by this expression here, right? Twice the absorption coefficient times the effective thickness times the internal uh, light intensity, right? Then from here, you apply the idea of detailed balance, which essentially says that the intensity of the light that comes in, right, that's this over here, right, has to be equal to the intensity of the light that is lost through either escape back out the top surface or through absorption. Okay, and uh, you know we work uh, or I've given you the expressions here for uh, the intensity of the light escaping and uh, the light being absorbed in terms of the internal intensity. So you can express, you can get a relationship between the incident light intensity and the internal light intensity, right? That's this over here. Then you can calculate the intensity of the light that's absorbed as a function of the incident light intensity and calculate the fraction of the light that's absorbed, right? And if you do that, what you end up seeing is that it's increased compared to kind of the single pass fractional absorption by this factor of 4n squared, right? So if you have an optically thick semiconductor, thickness much greater than the wavelength, then you can use these kinds of approaches to increase the absorption by up to this 4n squared factor. <clears throat> if you have a thin film semiconductor, right, where the thickness of the semiconductor, say, is comparable to the wavelength or maybe uh, uh, several, uh, several wavelengths, 
then it turns out that the absorption can be increased at selected wavelengths by an even larger factor. All right? But that by itself is not enough. What you really want to have is not just increasing the absorption by a large factor, but a high absolute absorption efficiency. Okay, so we'll come to that point uh, a little bit later again. So, so that's basically what goes into this situation here. And this has been known for a long time, right, 30 years. Right. <coughs> Uh, more recently, there's been a lot of interest in these kinds of approaches down here, all right? uh, using uh, scattering effects, uh, plasmonic excitations, and small metal stretches, and so forth. So to understand that, what we want to do is to look first at some of the ideas that underlie uh, plasmonic excitations and metals generally, all right? uh, and then metal nanostructure. So plasmonic excitation, right? the idea is that you have, uh, if you just have a bulk metal, right, and you have uh, an electromagnetic field that's incident, right? then you can excite at certain frequencies uh, oscillations of the electrons, okay? And the frequency of the oscillation will be a function of, uh, for the most part, the carrier density and the effective mass, all right? Um, if you have a metal, uh, if you're looking at the surface of the metal, or the interface between the metal and the dielectric, you can also have these kinds of collective excitations that are spatially confined to the vicinity of the metal surface of the metal dielectric interface, all right? And the properties of uh, these uh, surface plasmon excitations will be influenced by uh, the nature of this dielectric material here. Then, if you have some nanostructure, say a nanoparticle sphere or something like that, uh, what will happen is that you can have these kinds of excitations and they will further be influenced by the shape uh, of the structure here. All right, so what happens then is that if you have something like this, a small metal sphere, you have light that comes in at a particular wavelength, and at the right wavelength, you'll excite this kind of resonant oscillation right, of the electrons, and that's the surface plasma, or more strictly speaking, the surface plasma polariton excitation. Right? <clears throat> now, for our purposes, there are two consequences of this okay, that are uh, important. Right? One is that when you excite this surface plasma polariton uh, mode, right, it's a resonant excitation, right? so you can build up a very large energy density and, and correspondingly large field amplitude in the immediate vicinity of the particle. That's what's shown over here. And if you do calculations of this, uh, you can see that the field intensity is increased by orders of magnitude. Right? So it's a big effect. Right? But it's very localized within you know, several nanometers of, of the surface of the metal. Right? The other thing that can happen is that uh, you can have very strong scattering effects. Right? Uh, and the scattering effects will occur at wavelengths that are in the vicinity of the surface plasma polariton resonance, but actually also at wavelengths that extend uh, to, uh, to considerably longer wavelengths, all right, from the uh, plasma resonance wavelength. Okay, so then one can ask, well, what's the relative size of, of these different effects? Okay, and what I've shown here is just a simple calculation of the cross sections for uh, both absorption and scattering, right? And it turns out to depend on the size of the particle, right? So uh, the absorption cross sections are shown as dashed lines. The scattering cross sections are shown as solid lines, okay? And then therefore particles of uh, diameter 50, 80, and 100 nanometers, right? And what you see is that for the smaller particles, say 50 nanometers here, uh, what happens is that at pretty much all wavelengths, the absorption cross section is larger. Right? So the dominant effect is going to be absorption. Right? If you look at the larger particles, say 100 nanometers in diameter, right, at the shorter wavelengths, at, at the plasma resonance wavelength and shorter, roughly speaking, the absorption is still larger, but not by as large a factor. And at the longer wavelengths, uh, the scattering effects are larger. Okay, so depending on whether you want to take advantage of scattering or absorption, uh, there are different size ranges and so forth that, uh, that might be most appropriate. Right? Now, if you look at these, right, then, and you try to think about, okay, what do I want to try to exploit here? Right? Uh, the first thought is probably, well, we should try to exploit the absorption effects because you're changing things by orders of magnitude. Right? This is more likely to be a big effect. And in fact, <clears throat> I think people had exactly that thought. Uh, and in the context of organic photovoltaics, there's been quite a bit of work starting in the mid-90s, uh, and, and a lot of work uh, continuing to this day, uh, following up on this, to look at 
whether one can improve the performance of organic photovoltaics by integrating them with small metal particles. Okay. And uh, so I've shown three examples of this over here. And what, uh, you know, what, what these show is that uh, when you have these kinds of structures, you do see increases in photocurrent response at uh, actually quite, uh, over quite substantial ranges of wavelength. And these have been attributed in various ways to uh, the excitation of surface plasma resonances in the small metal particles, and in some cases to, to other uh, phenomena as well, such as recombination of the like, which is probably not what uh, you want to have. Uh, our interest, and in what I'll talk about mostly for the remainder of, of our time, is in how these ideas can be uh, used in solid state, meaning inorganic semiconductor devices. Okay, now for Typical inorganic semiconductors, uh, silicon gallium arsenide, you know, things of this uh, nature. If you look at the size of the absorption coefficients in these materials and the typical geometries for photovoltaic devices, even though the excitation of the surface, surface plasma polariton gives you a very large increase in field amplitude, it's too localized, right? It occurs over too small a volume for it to really have a big effect. Okay, so in most typical photovoltaic, good photovoltaic device geometries, uh, you can probably only take advantage of this to a limited degree. Right? However, if you look at scattering, right, the effects of scattering can extend into the far field. Right? So the spatial reach of these effects is, uh, can be much greater, and so these might be better prospects for uh, trying to incorporate these effects into, uh, say, inorganic semiconductor devices. Right? So, <coughs> When we first started thinking about these ideas, this was, these ideas, this was uh, quite a few years ago now, uh, we started off by doing uh, pretty much the simplest experiment that you could imagine, right? which is to take a silicon PN junction photodiode and deposit on the surface uh, gold nanoparticles of different sizes and to see what the effect of this is on the photocurrent response. Right? And based on what I just described, Right, what you might expect is that for the smaller particles, right, you might see an increase in photocurrent response due to these absorption effects at the shorter wavelengths, okay, because you're increasing the field amplitude uh, in the vicinity of these, and, and some of those carriers will be collected uh, and then show up as photocurrent. Right? And then as you go to the larger particles, you'll see some of this, but then you'll also see uh, increased photocurrent response extending to substantially longer wavelengths because of these scattering effects, essentially scattering light into uh, the semiconductor. And so when you do this experiment, that's essentially what you see. Right? Uh, so what I've plotted here is photocurrent response uh, for devices in either a bare uh, silicon PN junction diode without any of this on top, and then for uh, nanoparticles of different diameters composite over here. Right? And then over here, this is just uh, all these curves normalized to the uh, reference diode response. Right? And what you see is essentially what I described. Right? that for the smaller particles, you see increased photocurrent response at the shorter wavelengths, right? which we attribute to uh, essentially uh, absorption and excitation of plasma resonances and locally increased uh, photocurrent generation. And then for the largest particles, you see some of that, but then you see this uh, in increased photocurrent response extending to substantially longer wavelengths that we attribute to scattering. Okay? And uh, this is suggestive. Uh, in terms of uh, its utility for photovoltaic applications, because if you look at the wavelengths over which this uh, type of behavior occurs, right, the overlap with the solar spectrum is, is quite good. Right? So, uh, you know, so that suggests that maybe this could be useful for photovoltaics. Right? Now, <coughs> we also wanted to try to understand in more detail kind of some of the physics of, of these scattering effects. Okay, so what I've shown here is uh, another experiment where it's, well, it's, it's a similar experiment, except that uh, the PN junction was considerably deeper. Uh, and so you're really seeing the effects just of scattering. Right? So we do measurements of photocurrent response uh, with and without uh, 100 nanometer diameter particles deposited on the surface, and we plot the ratio over here. Right? And what you see is that at the longer wavelengths, right, you see the behavior that I described. Right? Uh, increased photocurrent response over a substantial range of wavelengths. But then, at shorter wavelengths, uh, it actually gets worse. All right? And this is undesirable. Okay, so uh, it would be nice to understand how this comes about and then how you might avoid this. 
right? Uh, so we also did uh, finite element numerical simulations of the electromagnetic field distributions for just the bare semiconductor structure and a semiconductor structure with a metal nanoparticle on top, right? You might be able to see here that you see this kind of bright region over here that is indicative of uh, light being scattered into the semiconductor by this part. Right? Uh, and we do the calculation from these of the ratio of absorption we would expect in this case to what we would expect in this case, and that's plotted over here. Right? Uh, the curve that you want to look at here is the black curve uh, for 100 nanometer diameter particles. And you see that actually looks very similar to this. Right? Uh, you have increased photocurrent absorption uh, over this range of wavelengths, and then you see a decrease over here. Right? So why does this happen? And can that tell us something about uh, the physics of, uh, of these processes? <clears throat> so it turns out that you can understand this okay, by looking at the polarizability of, say, a metal sphere. All right, so, so what polarizability is is the following. If you have, uh, say, a metal sphere, and you have an electromagnetic wave that's incident on it all right, uh, with a certain electric field amplitude, all right, then what will happen is that the electric field that's incident will excite oscillations of the electrons and will create an oscillating dipole moment all right, in the middle sphere. And to a first approximation, the scattered field can be thought of as essentially the radiation from the oscillating dipole. All right. Now, the polarizability okay, is the proportionality constant between that dipole moment and the amplitude of the electric field. All right. now, what I've plotted over here are the magnitude in the dashed line and the phase of the polarizability of gold sphere. Right? Uh, and then again up here, we have this uh, computed curve of uh, change in absorption where you see an increase over here and a decrease over here. Right? And what you see from the polarizability is that as you cross the plasmon resonance wave, which is over here, right, the maximum in the uh, magnitude of the polarizability, you have a change in the phase of the polarizability. Okay? When you're at longer wavelengths, the phase of the polarizability is small. When you're at shorter wavelengths, the phase uh, can be quite substantial. Right? And so what that means when you, is that when you have this non-zero phase associated with the polarizability, then this oscillating dipole is going to be somewhat out of phase with the incident and, and also the uh, directly transmitted electric field. So the scattered wave will also be out of phase with the directly transmitted and that ends up leading to this reduction in photocurrent response because when you have two waves that are superimposed and they're out of phase, right, you can have destructive interference. Right? So when you have a substantial non-zero phase, right, what happens is that the uh, portion of the wave that's directly transmitted into the semiconductor is out of phase with the portion that is scattered. And you can have destructive interference, and that leads to a reduction in the photocurrent response. Whereas when you have <coughs> excuse me, a very small value of the phase, then these will be almost in phase and you have constructive interference and you get an increase. All right. Now, what I described here, it's, it's, it's the right basic idea, but you have to be a little bit careful. Because what I showed you here is the polarizability of just an isolated metal sphere. But what you actually have is the metal sphere sitting on a semiconductor that has a pretty large dielectric constant. So, it's, so the behavior of this, when it's sitting on a semiconductor, is not necessarily the same as when it's just sitting by itself. Right? But in fact, uh, if you look at the results of electromagnetic simulations which take all these effects into account, you see that, in fact, this is what's going on. Right? So what I've done here is, show, is I'm showing you the results of calculations okay, of the directly transmitted component of the wave and the scattered component. Right? And what you see is that at the longer wavelengths, these are in phase. At the shorter wavelengths, these are out of phase. Right? So, so what this tells us is that you have to be a little bit careful. All right? You really have to understand and think about the physics of what's going on, because uh, in some circumstances, these effects can actually be detrimental. Okay? And in this case, you have detrimental effects because of this phase shift that you get in the scattered wave. All right. <clears throat> now, what I talked about so far right, has to do mostly uh, with uh, propagation, the effects of these particles when you're looking at propagation into a bulk volume of semiconductor. All right. But there's actually you know, probably more interest now in trying to use these kinds of effects in thin film structure. 
right? And in fact, this is also something that people looked at quite a few years ago, again, starting in uh, the mid-90s, uh, in this case, in the context of silicon insulator photodetectors. Okay? And then what uh, this paper by Stuart and Hall shows is that if you have metal islands okay, that are on top of the silicon insulator photodetector, right, what happens is that this thin layer of silicon all right, has discrete guided modes associated with it. And you can have scattering due to the presence of these metal islands of incident light into these modes. And when that happens, you get a large increase in the photocurrent response. Okay? And, and this has been explored in, in various uh, ways uh, subsequently as well. Right? This shows another uh, experiment of this nature where you can see that, especially at the longer wavelengths, you can actually get a very large increase, uh, factor increase in the photocurrent response. Although the starting point here is very low absorption to begin with. So you have to be a little bit careful. Right? Now, one of the questions that this gives rise to is, what is the optimum spatial arrangement of these scattering elements? Right? Uh, in these experiments, these were uh, just randomly distributed. Right? And they had some size distribution as well. Uh, but that is not necessarily uh, the best case. Right? Maybe you can do better by having periodic structures or having something, some more complicated spatial arrangement. Okay, so <clears throat> what I've shown here is a study that we did a few years ago to try to get at this uh, issue, right? where we looked at uh, photocurrent response of, uh, again, silicon on insulator uh, photodetective structures where you have scatterers that are either randomly distributed or arranged in a periodic two-dimensional structure, right? but with the same density in either case. And what happens essentially is that in this case, right, the what what dominates is just the behavior of a single particle as a scatter, all right, and you don't really have uh, long-range interference effects among different scatterers. Whereas in this case, you can have interference effects uh, between scattered waves from uh, many of these different scatterers, all right. Okay, and the way this shows up. Uh, and the results is as follows, right? If you look at this case over here, randomly distributed scatterers, right? And you compare the photocurrent response with these <coughs> scatterers to the photocurrent response of an adjacent device without them, and you count, uh, plot the ratio, right? What you see is this. You see moderate enhancement over potentially pretty wide ranges of width. When you have these periodic structures, okay, what you see is a little bit different. You see uh, at the peak, substantially larger increases in the photocurrent, right? Um, but over narrower ranges of wavelength. Okay? And it turns out that you can understand this um, <clears throat> in the following way. If you look at, again, electromagnetic numerical simulations of the electromagnetic field distributions, what, what happens is that uh, in the simulation, you see structure that's very similar to what you see over here. The peaks are sharper because when you simulate um, a structure is perfect, when you actually make it, it's not perfect. Right? But, but the basic structure is, is very similar. And you can show that each of these peaks corresponds to scattering of light at that wavelength into a particular guided mode of your thin silicon structure that's enabled by a particular reciprocal lattice vector of this periodic structure. Okay, over here. Okay, so when you have the right combination of those, then you get this large increase in photocurrent response. And, and you can use that, uh, in fact, uh, fairly quantitatively to explain what's seen uh, in the experiments over here, and therefore also to design uh, scattering structures that are optimal for different types of devices. All right. so, so this all sounds pretty good, but uh, you know, there's always a question, well, what's the downside? All right. uh, we saw one uh, example of this in, in these uh, phase shift uh, effects that I described. Uh, another one, which is probably more important, actually, is the fact that when you have these metals that are in close proximity to the semiconductor, then you can have absorption in the metal, right, which ends up being dissipated primarily as heat. That's undesirable. What you want is to have absorption in the semiconductor so you can collect the, the carriers as current. Now, what I've plotted here are the real and imaginary components. Epsilon 1 is the real component, epsilon 2 is the imaginary component of the dielectric functions of uh, silver, gold, and copper. Right? Now, it turns out if you work out the details um, that for a metal sphere, the surface plasma electron resonance occurs when epsilon 1, the real part of the, of the dielectric 
function is equal to minus 2. Right, so uh, when this curve intersects minus 2 over here, right, that gives you the energy, or equivalently the wavelength, of the plasma on resonance. But then at that wavelength, or at that energy, you have a non-zero value of epsilon 2, which corresponds to absorption in the middle. Right? You want to have this be as small as possible. And then pretty much the best you can do is in silver. Right? When you go to gold, uh, it gets higher. And in copper, it's higher still. Right? So for a lot of these plasmonic effects, you want to minimize losses in the middle. And so that's, that's one of the reasons that you see a lot of work in plasmonics is on silver or sometimes gold. Right? Um, so one of the factors that you really have to be careful of is there may be advantages to using these kinds of effects in photovoltaics, but there are also uh, some ways in which they operate to the detriment. And, and you have to weigh those against each other to decide uh, what's the right thing to do. OK, so uh, this is the end of the first part. All right? uh, the, and the key points that I tried to make are that, so first of all, uh, you know, the general idea is that we want to use uh, control over photon propagation, plasmonic effects, and so forth. Uh, for what I've described so far, mostly to increase optical absorption and therefore photocurrent in limited volumes. Right? Uh, you have these two effects that you can try to exploit, field localization effects and uh, scattering effects. But in doing this, you have to think about the trade-offs, the advantages and disadvantages uh, <coughs> that, that accrue. Uh, so you have this issue of, you know, do you want to have just a large enhancement factor or a high absolute absorption efficiency? And really what you want is this. Okay? Um, do you want to have a high peak absorption, or you want to have optimal absorption integrated over wavelength. And, and for a broadband application like photovoltaics, what you want is, is this. Right? And you have to be very careful in this and many other settings of the effects of absorption in the middle. Right? So, so this is the end of uh, the first part. What we'll do after the break is build upon these ideas and look at a couple examples of how these come to play in actual devices. OK, so that's it for, uh, for now. Yes. Uh, thank you, it was very nice talk. Uh, in the case of those nanoparticles, which were on the surface, and uh, they could scatter the light and couple to the uh, wave mode in the underneath field, I would like to know uh, what are the conditions uh, that those scattered light can be coupled to the waveguide wave guide modes? Uh, what requirements are required? Um, so, so if you're talking about the, uh, so say the periodic structures, right? Yeah. Then uh, the, the condition is that uh, the, the main condition is that uh, you have to have a, a matching of momentum, right? So, so you have a certain wave vector that's associated with your uh, guided mode, right? Uh, if you have normally incident light, right, it has no lateral momentum component, but you can get a component of lateral momentum that corresponds to one of the reciprocal lattice vectors <laughs> of this periodic structure. Right. Uh, and so there's a momentum matching condition right, that has to be satisfied, and then it'll end up only being satisfied at selected wavelengths that allow you to couple light that's coming in into it at a given wavelength into a particular guided mode. And then you get a peak in the uh, increase in, in the absorption efficiency. Now, if you have a single particle, right, basically the way that you can look at, at that is that you can do a spectral breakdown of all the different modes that are associated with your semiconductor structure. You have guided modes. Uh, if you have a thick semiconductor, you have substrate radiation modes, and you have kind of propagating modes that, that are not confined. And you can take, say, the, the radiation from a dipole of the surface, which is roughly the scattered wave. You can break it down into its constituent components that are either the guided modes, substrate radiation modes, or the propagating modes. And the component that corresponds to the guided modes will be really guided. The portion that, that uh, corresponds to the substrate radiation modes will go in, but it'll propagate into the substrate. And then the portion that corresponds to the propagating modes will not be confined. Uh, it won't go into the semiconductor in this world. Uh, so if you want to control which uh, wavelengths are confined inside the, wave, uh, inside the guided uh, uh, region, uh, we should uh, uh, we should manipulate the thickness and material of that uh, guided wave mode? Right, so the, uh, the thickness of the material, its dielectric uh, function, you know, refractiveness effectively, will determine 
uh, the nature of the guided modes, right? Saying that, like, you know, the dielectric slap, right? Um, and then the uh, spatial distribution of the scatterers, right, will determine this coupling, right, that's enabled by essentially the Fourier components of your scattering distribution. Thank you. Okay. All right. Any more questions? Otherwise, let's take 10 minutes and uh, we'll start again in 10 minutes.